Prometheus and Pandora. The creation of the world is a problem naturally fitted to excite the liveliest interest of man, its inhabitant. The ancient pagans, not having the information on the subject which we derive from the pages of scripture, had their own way of telling the story, which is as follows. Before earth and sea and heaven were created, all things wore one aspect to which we give the name of chaos, a confused and shapeless mass, nothing but dead weight in which, however, slumbered the seeds of things. Earth, sea, and air were all mixed up together, so the earth was not solid, the sea was not fluid, and the air was not transparent. God and nature at last interposed and put an end to this discord, separating earth from sea and heaven from both. The fiery part, being the lightest, sprang up and formed the skies. The air was next in weight and place. The earth, being heavier, sank below, and the water took the lowest place and buoyed up the earth. Here some god, it is not known which, gave his good offices in arranging and disposing the earth. He appointed rivers and bays their places, raised mountains, scooped out valleys, distributed woods, fountains, fertile fields, and stony plains. The air being cleared, the stars began to appear, fishes took possession of the sea, birds of the air, and four-footed beasts of the land. But a nobler animal was wanted, and man was made. It is not known whether the Creator made him of divine materials, or whether in the earth, so lately separated from heaven, there lurked still some heavenly seeds. Prometheus took some of this earth, and kneading it up with water, made man in the image of the gods. He gave him an upright stature, so that while all other animals turn their faces downward and look to the earth, he raises his to heaven and gazes on the stars. Prometheus was one of the Titans, a gigantic race, who inhabited the earth before the creation of man. To him and his brother Epimetheus was committed the office of making man and providing him and all other animals with the faculties necessary for their preservation. Epimetheus undertook to do this and Prometheus was to overlook his work when it was done. Epimetheus accordingly proceeded to bestow upon the different animals the various gifts of courage, strength, swiftness, sagacity, wings to one, claws to another, a shelly covering to a third, etc. But when man came to be provided for, who was to be superior to all other animals, Epimetheus had been so prodigal of his resources that he had nothing left to bestow upon him. In his perplexity, he resorted to his brother Prometheus, who, with the aid of Minerva, went up to heaven and lighted his torch at the chariot of the sun and brought down fire to man. With this gift, man was more than a match for all other animals. It enabled him to make weapons wherewith to subdue them, tools with which to cultivate the earth, to warm his dwelling, so as to be comparatively independent of climate, and finally, to introduce the arts and to coin money, the means of trade and commerce. Woman was not yet made. The story, absurd enough, is that Jupiter made her, and sent her to Prometheus and his brother, to punish them for their presumption in stealing fire from heaven, and man for accepting the gift. The first woman was named Pandora. She was made in heaven, every god contributing something to perfect her. Venus gave her beauty, Mercury persuasion, Apollo music, etc. Thus equipped, she was conveyed to earth, and presented to Epimetheus, who gladly accepted her, though cautioned by his brother to beware of Jupiter and his gifts. Epimetheus had in his house a jar, in which were kept certain noxious articles for which, in fitting man for his new abode, he had had no occasion. Pandora was seized with an eager curiosity to know what this jar contained, and one day she slipped off the cover and looked in. Forthwith, there escaped a multitude of plagues for hapless men, such as gout, rheumatism, and colic for his body, and envy, spite, and revenge for his mind, and scattered themselves far and wide. Pandora hastened to replace the lid, but alas, 
the whole contents of the jar had escaped. One thing only accepted, which lay at the bottom, and that was hope. So we see at this day, whatever evils are abroad, hope never entirely leaves us. And while we have that, no amount of other ills can make us completely wretched. Another story is that Pandora was sent in good faith by Jupiter to bless man, that she was furnished with a box containing her marriage presents into which every god had put some blessing. She opened the box incautiously, and the blessings all escaped, hope only accepted. This story seems more probable than the former, for how could hope, so precious a jewel as it is, have been kept in a jar full of all manner of evils, as in the former statement. The world being thus furnished with inhabitants, the first age was an age of innocence and happiness, called the Golden Age. Truth and right prevailed, though not enforced by law, nor was there any magistrate to threaten or punish. The forest had not yet been robbed of its trees to furnish timbers for vessels, nor had men built fortifications around their towns. There were no such things as swords, spears, or helmets. The earth brought forth all things necessary for man, without his labor in plowing or sowing. Perpetual spring reigned, flowers sprang up without seed, the rivers flowed with milk and wine, and yellow honey distilled from the oaks. Then succeeded the Silver Age, inferior to the golden, but better than that of brass. Jupiter shortened the spring and divided the year into seasons. Then, first, men had to endure the extremes of heat and cold, and houses became necessary. Caves were the first dwellings, and leafy coverts of the woods, and huts woven of twigs. Crops would no longer grow without planting. The farm was obliged to sow the seed and the toiling ox to draw the plow. Next came the brazen age, more savage of temper, and readier to the strife of arms, yet not altogether wicked. The hardest and worst was the Iron Age. Crime burst in like a flood. Modesty, truth, and honor fled. In their places came fraud and cunning, violence, and the wicked love of gain. Then seamen spread sails to the wind, and the trees were torn from the mountains to serve for keels to ships and vex the face of ocean. The earth, which till now had been cultivated in common, began to be divided off into possessions. Men were not satisfied with what the surface produced, but must dig into its bowels and draw forth from thence the ores of metals. Mischievous iron and more mischievous gold were produced. War sprang up, using both as weapons. The guest was not safe in his friend's house, and sons-in-law and fathers-in-law, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, could not trust one another. Sons wished their fathers dead that they might come to inheritance. Family lay prostrate. The earth was wet with slaughter, and the gods abandoned it, one by one, till Astraea alone was left. And finally, she also took her departure. Jupiter, seeing this state of things, burned with anger. He summoned the gods to council. They obeyed the call and took the road to the palace of heaven. The road, which any one may see in a clear night, stretches across the face of the sky and is called the Milky Way. Along the road stand the palaces of the illustrious gods. The common people of the skies live apart on either side. Jupiter addressed the assembly. He set forth the frightful condition of things on the earth, and closed by announcing his intention to destroy the whole of its inhabitants, and provide a new race unlike the first, who would be more worthy of life, and much better worshippers of the gods. So saying, he took a thunderbolt, and was about to launch it at the world, and destroy it by burning. But recollecting the danger that such a conflagration might set heaven itself on fire, he changed his plan and resolved to drown it. The north wind, which scatters the clouds, was chained up, the south was sent out, and soon covered all the face of heaven with a cloak of pitchy darkness. The clouds, driven together, resound with a crash, torrents of rainfall, the crops are laid low, the year's labor of the husbandman perishes in an hour. Jupiter, not satisfied with his own waters, calls on his brother Neptune to aid him with his. He lets loose the rivers and pours them over the land. At the same time, he heaves the land with an earthquake, 
and brings in the reflux of the ocean over the shores. Flocks, herds, men, and houses are swept away, and temples with their sacred enclosures profaned. If any edifice remained standing, it was overwhelmed, and its turrets lay hid beneath the waves. Now all was sea, sea without shore. Here and there an individual remained on a projecting hilltop, and a few in boats pulled the oar where they had lately driven the plow. The fishes swim among the treetops. The anchor is let down into a garden, where the graceful lambs played but now unwieldy sea calves gamble. The wolf swims among the sheep. The yellow lions and tigers struggle in the water. The strength of the wild boar serves him not, nor his swiftness the stag. The birds fall with weary wing into the water, having found no land for a resting place. Those living beings whom the water spared fell a prey to hunger. Parnassus alone of all the mountains overtopped the waves, and there Deucalion and his wife Pyrrha of the race of Prometheus found refuge, he a just man and she a faithful worshipper of the gods. Jupiter, when he saw none left alive but this pair and remembered their harmless lives and pious demeanor, ordered the north winds to drive away the clouds and disclose the skies to earth and earth to the skies. Neptune also directed Triton to blow on his shell and sound a retreat to the waters. The waters obeyed, and the sea returned to its shores, and the rivers to their channels. Then Deucalion thus addressed Pyrrha, O wife, only surviving woman, joined to me first by the ties of kindred and marriage, and now by a common danger, would that we possess the power of our ancestor Prometheus, and could renew the race as he at first made it. But as we cannot, let us seek yonder temple and inquire of the gods what remains for us to do. They entered the temple, deformed as it was with slime, and approached the altar where no fire burned. There they fell prostrate on the earth, and prayed the goddess to inform them how they might retrieve their miserable affairs. The oracle answered, Depart from the temple with head veiled and garments unbound, and cast behind you the bones of your mother. They heard the words with astonishment, Pyrrha first broke silence. We cannot obey. We dare not profane the remains of our parents. They sought the thickest shades of the wood and revolved the oracle in their minds. At length, Deucalion spoke. Either my sagacity deceives me or the command is one we may obey without impiety. The earth is the great parent of all. The stones are her bones. These we may cast behind us, and I think this is what the oracle means. At least, it will do no harm to try. They veiled their faces, unbound their garments, and picked up stones and cast them behind them. The stones, wonderful to relate, began to grow soft and assume shape. By degrees, they put on a rude resemblance to the human form, like a block half finished in the hands of the sculptor. The moisture and slime that were about them became flesh. The stony part became bones. The veins remained veins, retaining their name, only changing their use. Those thrown by the hand of the man became men, and those by the woman became women. It was a hard race and well adapted to labor, as we find ourselves to be at this day, giving plain indications of our origin. The comparison of Eve to Pandora is too obvious to have escaped. Milton, who introduces it in Book 4 of Paradise Lost. More lovely than Pandora, whom the gods endowed with all their gifts, and oh, too like in sad event, when to the unwiser son of Japhet, brought by Hermes, she ensnared mankind with her fair looks to be avenged on him who had stole Jove's authentic fire. Prometheus and Epimetheus were sons of Iepetus, which Milton changes to Japhet. Prometheus has been a favorite subject with the poets. He is represented as the friend of mankind, who interposed in their behalf when Jove was incensed against them, and who taught them civilization and the arts. But as in doing so he transgressed the will of Jupiter, he drew down on himself the anger of the ruler of gods and men. Jupiter had him chained to a rock on Mount Caucasus, 
where a vulture preyed on his liver, which was renewed as fast as devoured. This state of torment might have been brought to an end at any time by Prometheus if he had been willing to submit to his oppressor, for he possessed a secret which involved the stability of Job's throne, and if he would have revealed it, he might have been at once taken into favor. But that he disdained to do. He has therefore become the symbol of magnanimous endurance of unmerited suffering, and strength of will resisting oppression. Byron and Shelley have both treated this theme. The following are Byron's lines. Titan, to whose immortal eyes the sufferings of mortality, seen in their sad reality, were not as things that gods despise. What was thy pity's recompense? A silent suffering and intense? The rock, the vulture, and the chain, all that the proud can feel of pain. The agony they do not show, the suffocating sense of woe. The godlike crime was to be kind, to render with thy precepts less, the sum of human wretchedness, and strengthen men with his own mind, and baffled as thou wert from high, still in thy patient energy, in the endurance and repulse, of thine impenetrable spirit, which earth and heaven could not convulse, a mighty lesson we inherit. Byron also employs the same allusion in his Ode to Napoleon Bonaparte. Or, like the thief of a fire from heaven, wilt thou withstand the shock, and share with him, the unforgiven, his vulture and his rock. 